Welcome to the Reality Revolution. So super excited today. I have Jesse Boudreau. He is a permaculturalist, a herbalist, father, drummer, Buddhist, Taoist, breatharian, and teaches permaculture in a variety of other subjects. And I was excited to have him on to help understand as we move into this new earth energy, how to find our connection with the earth and in the process, how to find our connection with our breath and the sun. And Jesse is sort of an expert at this and has helped teach other people on a variety of subjects that I'm super interested in, as I talk about in my book, using um, Qigong exercises, all kinds of things. So, so much to talk about. So welcome to the Reality Revolution, Jesse. Blessings, brother. Thank you for having me. I'm super glad to be here. Oh, fantastic, Love man. You. So you're in, you're Sorry. in New Mexico Love then, right? Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah. indeed. Okay, cool. <laughs> And there's there's a it's a really good place a good community that's formed there, um, dealing on permaculture and and that there, there's a lot of people that are really connecting to the earth and and that kind of thing right and yeah my my belief is we're kind of going through a transition I, even people that you would not normally think are starting to say hey I want to go work on that garden outside and and maybe change what I've been eating all this processed food and. It's a it's an internal transformation going on worldwide. People, I you know, grandmothers, people I would never expect are finding this connection. Can you speak to that? Have you seen a sort of change in the way people think about food in the earth? Yes, and I'm super grateful that it's happening because yeah. this has been my heart's core for 20 years now, um, and I really see this is you know uh, probably the crux of our collective malaise, you know, mm -hmm. is our disconnection from the earth. Um, one, of, one of my teachers says, when your relationship with your food breaks down, all your other relationships break down because that's your, your core connection with uh, the earth mother. Right. Um, so, and my experience is there's a whole health path um, involved in just getting yourself out into the garden um, and practicing um, the arts of life cultivation. Right. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my own experience. Maybe you can help me out. So, you know, starting about a year ago, hey, I'm going to start my, my garden. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and get seeds and, and just start gardening up. And, you know, it looks great. It's growing. And then we just got infected with all kinds of bugs, eating everything up. And then it was like, you know, I, do I want to put a pesticide on it? It's going to damage it. And it, it was just sort of a, it was very frustrating because uh, there was obviously some lessons. You kind of talk about communicating with the plants and getting to know it in a certain, what do I do in that particular case? I start my garden. What do I do in those cases where it seems like uh, it's fighting back? The earth is fighting back against me, right? Well, that's a very good question. It's, you know, really these life lessons that come through interacting with nature, um, you start to glean um, understandings, you know, including with respect to your gardening style and what's happening, you know, in your garden. Right. Um, one thing that is part of my field of expertise is I do a lot of like food forest design, uh, mm -hmm. utilizing perennial plants, you know. Right. Perennial plants, um, if you look at a typical, and, and, you know, designing like a forest that's layered. And if you look at a typical acre of forest, there's way more food and medicine than a typical acre of field. And right. all of our cultivars, um, like our spinach and our bok choy and our, you know, broccoli and all these things uh, have been cultivated out of wild predecessors, annual right. wild predecessors that were more resilient to things like bugs and, you know, infestation. So we find that most of our cultivars require a lot of care. Um, and you can treat them organically. Uh, instead of using insecticides, you can use like insecticidal soaps. You can use things like pyrethrum or neem oil. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very much into biodynamic techniques, which is uh, the advent, you know, child of uh, Rudolf Steiner. Right. Who, you know, was really brilliant with gardening. And so some of the things that they talk about and that is sort of like the energetic imprinting. So if you're getting one kind of bug in that style, um, 
and you want to get rid of it, you burn it, pulverize it, turn it into a homeopathic spray. The bug itself. And spray your garden with it. Ah, okay. Kind of like a warning to the bugs, like, this is what happens, you know. As a Buddhist, that's a little harder for me. I don't <laughs> yeah. care to do. And this is part of the idea, you know, of like our agricultural style is so much about control. And it's so based on annual cultivars that are eroding our soil. Whereas regenerative agriculture, permaculture, food forestry, we're growing uh, perennial plants that come back year after year, get bigger and bigger, have more medicinal value. Um, and it requires more of like a, a forager, hunter gather sort of way, you know, right. and less uh, effort and energy. I want to go back. Let's go back a little bit because we're talking about all the. There obviously was a point in your life where it, it was a spiritual experience, had to be, right? Where you said, This is, this is my life, a connection that you had. I want to hear your story. Tell me the story, how this became your life's purpose. Wow. That, you know, really pretty well brings me to the beginning. My early memory, I always share this in my classes because um, it just struck, you know, stuck out for me anyways in my life. But my earliest memory was waking up in a, uh, I'd gone on a hike with my folks. I had fallen asleep on my dad's back. Um, I woke up and he set me down, you know, in the mountains in this field of flowers. And I was like, cool, (laughs) I'm in heaven. You know, I made it. Right. right on you know and it really was it was a feeling it was a sensorial experience you know and i feel like that was the day the plants first called me you know mm-hmm. um, and then growing up i grew up in a very interesting place i grew up in los alamos new mexico which is where the um, ten thousand native people used to live in caves and everything and it's also the birthplace of the atom bomb right um so uh I grew up like playing around on mesas and, you know, in, in uh, caves where there were arrowheads and um, around about in high school, I'd been stan- living a standard American, you know, sort of a suburban lifestyle, skateboarding, eating McDonald's and everything like right. that. And uh, uh, around my teen years, late teen years, I got involved with uh, vision plants, you know, and I was starting to feel this need to, to feed my spirit, you know, that I didn't identify at the time. I just felt, you know, empty. You know? Right. So um, I was also fortunate enough that my, my folks were Christian, but they were non-dogmatic. And I had a long time from the time I was young too, like early, I'd watch Kung Fu movies and I'd see the Buddhas and stuff. And I'd feel this sense of reverence, you know? Right. And um. So there's these little things, little streams that came in. And then, you know, the vision plants were really what kind of opened me up to a very deep uh, one particular experience with uh, psilocybin mushrooms in the mountains. I just Mm -hmm. felt this complete connectedness of all things. I felt like I had um, kind of uh, moved out of the thought um, sort of program or circle of our Mm -hmm. culture to see a larger picture of this connection, you know, and this sense of oneness that we're all one. Um, From then I started to study Buddhism more, started to meditate. um, And then in the college years, it went down. And as I started to grow into my fatherhood and as I started to age, I started to have difficulty with, you know, my body i was eating organic and stuff but uh standard american still you know like burgers and breakfast burritos right. and beer you know right. yeah and and then i uh got i needed psychologically and physically i needed a change so i got back into i had heard about sun gazing i started playing with that and meditating mm-hmm. and i switched to a raw food diet you know at the suggestion of my wife and some other uh, good lady friends, you know how the, the women tend to be wiser in these ways. <laughs> this is true. Um, and uh, I found that it totally improved my energy, my how I felt, etc. And that just moved on into fasting, moved on into juicing, and um, continuing these practices has led to the point where 
now I have been on liquids alone, or I would say like 95, 98% liquids um, for the last four years. Wow. Um, so you have one solid food meal a day, basically, or not even that? No, I, no. Uh, what I'll do, I'm a family man. I'm still in my householder years. Right, so right. like when I'm with my family and they're macking on some chips or something like that, sometimes I'll have some seaweed. That's like my instead of chips. Right. That's something I can join them when we're like watching a movie or, you know, something like that. Right. I, I look for an opportunity to connect with my family when, when I decide to eat something. And earlier on, my mentor taught me, you know, it's important that you eat with your family, it, you know, at least once a right. week, just to maintain this sense of connection. So people get this idea of breatharianism and sort of puritanical, you know, like it's, it's a process and it should take you, it's taken me 10 years to move to right. this. You know, you have to move your body gently. The Kundalini energy is, you know, the prana energy. It can be dangerous. It's electricity. It, right. It can fry your nerves and fry your, you know, your mind. Um, so it's. It, so uh, I, I got to the raw food from another, from the person that created Reality Transurfing ha, had taken this upon as a full diet, eating only raw foods and made, make, makes an argument in one of his books that, you know, we're, we're cooking out the, the, the chi from the food or whatever you want to call it. And so the, the way to get that purified energy. So I started and it's hard. The raw diet is very hard. There's a restaurant in Southern California that, that serves, um, some people's blood type might be a little bit different. I found, you know, but the, the, the hardest thing for me was, uh, I still am, I'm still of the breakfast burrito hamburger grew up on a ranch you know with cattle had was given burger all my life and i still have that craving these cravings that would mm -hmm. come up uh when i would just try to eat the raw food so it would work for a couple of days and i would feel it but that just this overwhelming craving it's an addiction just as bad as smoking cigarettes or you know some drug is is the food that we eat this that it's an addiction right um well, that's the thing is i know intellectually what i need to eat but it's yeah help me with that so that's the thing is we're beings of pleasure and beings of habit and right. the things that we that give us pleasure we habituate to and we don't realize that a lot of the things that we habituate to aren't necessarily to our higher benefit and feeling of well-being right right so there's things we have to move through there's also to be considered you know as an herbalist you know because i would want to move people gently through this thought process and way, you know, right. is you have to be respectful of your genetic history, your, your blood type, like you said, mm -hmm. your, um, uh, dosha, you know, I study Ayurveda. So, right. you know, how watery are you? How I'm, I'm a pitta dosha. So I have high digestion, highly active, you know, um, these things help for me as an individual, right? But this is something anyone can do, and it's through building these these practice various practices. Maybe we'll get into in a minute, right? Um, but um, and it's a process, so you want to move your body slowly. And the way it, it worked for me best all along is to just be adding, right? So instead of taking away your burger, make sure you have a uh, one way to do it is wrap it in a big leaf of lettuce with a bunch of veg and, you know, and have like sweet potatoes instead of like potatoes that are more nutrient dense. And right. if there's ways to like hack it, you know, or, or have your burger and then have your next meal be a big fat salad. You know what I mean? Uh, to help move it through and do the cleansing and right. all that stuff. But, um, and then your body will start to crave. It will start to want that, that better thing, especially if you make a habit of it. Right. Uh, because that whole thing of us being beings of um, pleasure and habit, uh, anything that you habituate to for 30 to 90 days, you can continue as a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I've done is I started with changing my diet, adding meditation and sun gazing. Then I started working with, you know, brahmacharya practice, um, qigong practice, grounding, you know, uh, various other practices that I've been trained so that now it's part of my everyday routine. And then I can maintain this state and do my work and serve my family and my community and not blow my energy out because right. it's this whole thing about energy. 
Um, right. So tell me if, if I want to start the raw food diet, what's a good start? If I, you know, go to Sprouts, uh, garden's full of bugs, so I can't use it yet. I, I can start to grow some stuff. But if I go to Sprouts and I say, okay, I want to have the majority of my week do my best to eat mostly raw foods. What mm -hmm. food should I start with? Well, really, you know, they're all, you know, all plants have a different medicine, you know, and they're all beneficial to you. And this is something I also try to bring out uh, through our classes and teaching mm -hmm. is learning to dial into your own sense awareness of, you know, what you need, uh, because we're all, you know, our higher selves are all equal. We're all right. endowed with the same, you know, this vehicle is, you know, uh, very uh, sensitive electrical biochemical laboratory, you know, and so mm -hmm. we can start to feel from the inside out how we feel, you know, I mean, what's, what's best for us. And a cleanse, you know, often will uh, help you to reset this sense so that when you do go to the store and you're trying to figure out what you want to eat, um, that um, you, you have a real feeling from your body. Right. Um, like intuitive eating. But at the same time, you know, in terms of like trying to have a well-rounded raw experience, you want to make sure you get plenty of greens, mm -hmm. plenty of fruits. It's good to do things like mono meals occasionally, like where you just have a big cantaloupe, you know, or a big melon, watermelon for one of your meals. Um, you want to have, uh, if you're going to do uh, seeds and nuts, it's important to soak and sprout them because they have a phytic acid layer. It's a nutrient inhibitor that will uh, actually take nutrient out of your body. But once you soak it or sprout it, it increases its nutrient density and its bioavailability. Oh, that's um, cool. So you offer some cleanses too, right? Yes, I offer a, a superfood cleanse that's really great because it's a 30 day cleanse. And the way it's formulated is such that it um, detoxifies the glyphosate out of your body and rebuilds your biome, your microbiome, because that's another big piece of this is rebuilding your microbiome because mm -hmm. we've all been inundated by glyphosate, which glyphosate, in case you're unaware, is uh, a remnant of uh, the war machine. It was Agent Orange. It's, a, it's an incredible antibiotic, so it destroys the um, uh, microbes in the soil and it makes it so the plant can't uptake nutrients. When it gets in you, it does the same thing. Wow. So it cleans that out. It nourishes your cells with nutrient dense uh, food. That's the other thing, you know, with raw foods as opposed to, and this is a raw cleanse, uh, as opposed to uh, other foods is that um, they're high in water. They're high in the chi, as you said, biophotons, it's measurable. It's, if you look up Kirlian photography, you can right. see pictures of uh, raw food having more electrical energy than cooked food um, and it has more nutrient density because when you cook it you cook that all effervesces into the air um, so um, but this is a very super dense uh, juice green juice um, and then there's aminos that this is the only anabolic cleanse so it will build your body as mm -hmm. you're um, cleansing instead of just being catabolic it's anabolic Oh, okay. Um, and then there's a tart cherry juice that induces melatonin so you get better sleep. And then the uh, uh, antioxidants in the cherry juice help with cellular re rejuvenation while you're sleeping. So you kind of double up on your rejuvenation while you're asleep. And that's another thing with this practice is finding ways to uh, build your energy, contain your energy, and, you know, uh, that's things like sleep and meditation and a whole bunch of stuff. And then the last part of the cleanse is a parasite uh, cleanse because mm -hmm. that's part of the thing that happens with these cravings is that we don't realize when we have things like candida in our body or parasites is they're clamoring in our consciousness for the foods that they want. Ah, yeah. makes sense. So once you clean, the, clean this out, then you have more of this sense, of, sense awareness of what I need nuts and roots feel more grounding and, you know, um, sort of coptic and um, strengthening, you know, greens feel more nourishing, you know, fruits feel like, you know, very energetic, you know, and cleansing. So um, it becomes this whole fun experiential thing. And another big tip is to make sure that you 
have fun with it and make, you can make, there's so many chefs out there and people making beautiful food that you can have anything that you normally have and do it raw. Right. So. Very cool. So uh, let's, let's talk, you know, the, what you would start your starting point where you started meditating and, and, and sun gazing. And I, I want to talk about sun gazing because I have noticed benefits from it. Um, there's always that little voice that says, you know, when, when I was a kid, you they don't look at the sun, you know, it's going to hurt your eyes. Uh, but I, I can actually feel a physical effect on my energy centers. So tell me more about it. How do I, what's the proper way to, to sun gaze and tell me about the benefits, how to do it. Oh yeah. I love this. This is like core to my practice. Cause it's this whole thing. Of, I've been studying medical astrology and mm-hmm. the sun is the heart of the cosmos. Um, yeah. So in medical astrology, it corresponds to your own human heart. And we are heart beings primarily and first. And right. form, when our, the first cells that form, form the heart. You know? And that's the electromagnetic field that extends beyond our body, emanates from, from your heart. Um, so when you sun gaze, it's sort of attuning your heart field and your electromagnetic field to the vibration of the sun and the vibration of the day. Um, it's important to do it the first hour or last hour of the day when the sun rays are attenuated by the oblique angle that they hit the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And at the time there's very little UV, um, zero to like five, you know. Midday is not a good t- time for sun gaze. You, you know, there's times when you should protect your eyes when you're on snow or water, you know, mm-hmm. but mostly, the sun, the sun stimulates the rods and cones in your eyes to uh, process uh, stress chemicals like cortisol. Um, mm-hmm. and it also stimulates your pineal gland um, to decalcify because it's photosensitive. Um, and actually, there's a man who started teaching this name, HRM, who is another uh, breatharian. And NASA actually studied him because they were thinking that this would be very useful for space travel, you know. And they, so they studied him physiologically, all kinds. They, they found one noticeable thing was his third eye was larger. His, his pineal gland was about the size of a golf ball or most, most of ours are atrophied because we're sedentary or we're watching blue light. You know, we're not getting this full spectrum light and activity that, that um, you know, stimulates this. So, and then there's the whole thing of the like pranic path of it uh, nourishing, you know, uh, your mitochondria are nourished on the infrared spectrum um, Mm -hmm. by the sun, you know, Um, you get vitamin D where like at Steiner says, we're like a plant, you know, that makes soil on the inside so we can walk around. We photosynthesize vitamin D and the eyes are like the window to the soul. So it's, it's like, I find it to be physically healing and emotionally healing. Yeah. And at first, I remember, you know, you start with, that's the other thing I should mention is you want to start with 10 seconds at a time, 10 seconds the first day, 20 seconds the next day, 30 seconds the next day. And I did that up to 45 minutes. And that's supposed to be the top, you know, and that experience was one of the most um, uh, profound experiences of my life up there with the birth of my kids, you know, wow. experience with my wife you know, and my shamanic experiences with uh, vision medicine, um, uh, where it was this feeling of complete unity. You feel the fontanelle of your your head start to open up because this is a pranic channel of the Mm -hmm. toric field. And I remember the first few times I would would be weeping and I didn't feel sad or anything, but I was just, and I had this sense like when your father looks at you and he says, you know, like, don't try to tell yourself that bullshit. I just love you, man. You know? Like, right. I definitely you. feel it in my, I feel my third eye. You, it, it, you can feel it start to vibrate and, and warm. It's warmer and you can definitely feel the, the where it's at. It starts just from the beginnings of what I've done. And, you know, I, of course, I'm like, is, is that just going through my head? It, 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 it's so clear that I can feel it. So you, you, you feel that too, right? It's the when you first start, you feel it right there in your head as if it's also you, looking. Absolutely. A hundred percent, hundred percent. 
And um, that's another thing I should mention is after you sun gaze, it's good to turn away from the sun and cup your eyes. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice black plate. Most people have reported to me and my own experience has been uh, sacred geometric patterns or, you know, spirals of sparks and, you know, and you want to just hold it there until the little green, you know, flashes and things all go away and it's just dark. And that mm -hmm. way you kind of absorb the prana of the sun more in your, in your body and the experience, you know, um, and, uh, and one more thing would be to be grounded if you can, you know, barefoot on the, on the ground, because barefoot this is the ground. a practical, you know, exchange. So, so if I, I where I live, the sunset kind of goes below the houses, right? I, I mean, I can do it kind of before. Um, is it okay if it's a little bit before the sun sunset or just not at midday at the? Yeah, I've okay. done it as many as in the first two hours, you know, and uh, there was actually something HRM talks about is it was a torture. They were trying to torture people in Vietnam, American soldiers by uh, prying their eyes open and having them look at the sun. And they found that they had all kinds of healing, healing of, you know, um, vision problems, all kinds of, you know, and they were like, and, and in midday, they thought it was going to be a terrible thing. Right. But, but no harm was done. So I don't want to suggest to people to do that. I, I want to, you know, suggest people stay safe. Right, right. Do it during safe hours, you know, but there is some lenience and, and, and play there, like on, on the timing for sure very cool and you can get actually you can get these uv meters online you mm -hmm. know that you can keep in check you know um and you just hold it to the sun and it'll tell you the, the how intense the uv is um and so if it's under you know six you're totally good bizarre question have you ever heard the sun talk to you so this isn't too bizarre a question. This is something that I've felt more and more yeah. in my experience as, as you open up your intuition through these practices, through meditation, sun gazing, you know, et cetera, you start to realize that you're, you know, we're beings of energy in a sea of energy. And it's like, does a fish know it's underwater? And, and we're having this subtle electromagnetic exchange with each other through our electromagnetic fields all the time. And with plants, animals, the earth, the sun, you yeah. know. Um, and so this first started happening to me, I noticed with plants, because we'd be foraging in the forest or looking for herbs. And it's not like, you know, you know, like if I go this way, I'm going to, I'm going to find herbs. You just feel like, I feel like there's something over here, you know. And then often you'll, you'll find it, you know, and it's like the plants are calling you. Um, another herbalist told us before we were wiser in our ways about it, uh, my wife was dealing with some issues and he said, you need to go, uh, go get some yarrow, go find some yarrow in the forest, some white yarrow. And um, she's like, and then harvest it. And he's like, nope, just go sit with it. Because you can actually get the, you know, this is the Japanese idea of nature bathing. You can actually get benefit and healing from the plants and other animals, their healing properties, just by being around them. And we're medicine for each other this way too. And we can heal each other just with our presence, you know, and loving vibration toward one another. Yeah. I keep on thinking there's a, a Drumvala Melchizedek talks about how planets go into fourth dimension and there's this process that a lot of people on the planet go through where they connect with the sun and the earth at the same time, they sort of become a conduit and they create a reality around themselves. And so we have this whole planet that's going through chaos, but there's a bunch of bubbles where it's all perfect. Everything's going great. And so, like you said, when you're grounding and you're experiencing the sun, it's almost like I'm a conduit in that moment where the sun is sort of having sex with the earth through me. Like I'm just sort of like, does that make sense? It's kind of a crazy, but I feel like I'm this instrument and it's just uh, that that's why the grounding is so important. There's, there's a two way reaction going on. They're using me for this interchange of energy and alchemy that's occurring. Right. Absolutely. I love that you said that. And especially <laughs> when you said instrument, because this is, you know, the word atone is connected right. to a tune and this is an instrument. Right. And when we interact with the sun and the earth, 
it attunes this instrument. And we're actually, our, our pineal gland is a, a microcrystalline uh, transmitter receiver, as is our DNA. And, and our sun is piezoelectric, superconductor, conductor, uh, and semiconductor. So right. this energy is just moving. And our, I uh, posit that consciousness, you know, that this is just a radio uh, signal uh, or, or radio uh, wavelength, sort right. of, this body, and that we're receiving a conscious, conscious, God consciousness as electricity moving through our body, but it's not us. It's coming kind of from outside of us. Almost. Right. You know, it makes me really believe in the electric version of the sun, that the sun is electric and that we're just interfeel, interacting in a field of electricity. And, and the plants are these master um, instruments that are also kind of, they don't need to eat. They're just taking in the electricity and, and, and sort of, uh, and that's the best way I can express it. It's sort of an, an electro in, interactive universe that we're walking around in. So, um, you know, I, I kind of get that feeling even um, when I'm walking around nature, I'm looking at the quantum field in expression and so you know once you've tuned like you said you once you've done the plant medicine or done any kind of psychedelic you have these visions which can be fractal oriented but a lot of it looks like nature a lot of what i see mm -hmm. is just sort of uh just different complexes of nature and so nature is this apps actual physical expression of these energies just all around us and so it's interesting people are walking around they don't know that they're just walking through a field of god expressed in you know in nature and plants and trees um we're just blind to it it's interesting how we just walk around with blindfolds on for a lot of us not aware that of the this divinity that's all around us <laughs> i love that the way you said that and i, I love that idea. it resonates with me with the alchemical understanding of as above so below right i say that every plant and every human being down here and all this is just a reflection you know of the stars in the heavens and the universe right. you know so um you are a galaxy you know you absolutely there's so much life in you you know and so we may have been a galaxy before we've just chosen this we might be a galaxy now at the same time could be <laughs> any one of those possibilities so but um i think what you're doing is is you're at the, the the forefront of this major change that we have happening on this planet or we've been at a point where we've been through in an industrial age a technological age where we're changing we're, we're understanding science but there's something missing there's an emptiness just like what you talked about that feeling of it's just emptiness and people are starting to see that it's not about those industrial or technological advances. It's an, a deeper understanding beyond all technology of, of our connection to this planet. It's uh, happening. I think we're going to, the futurist in me sees a huge change um, as this happens. Um, I want to get your vibe on that. I, 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 I with some of your videos, I, I, you, you're um, contemplating a sort of future um, that's happening. I, I, I want share me your vision with what you see as we move towards this evolution. Well, I think this is uh, just a natural unfolding. You know, I'm into the Drumfalo information too, and have been studying astrology. You know, that whole right. thing of like the Cal Yuga was us moving away from the galactic center, and 2012 was like us turning the corner and coming back. Coming and now we're being bathed in waves of light as we get closer to the galactic center and this is activating our dna you know and i believe all of us are pranic anyone can do this mm -hmm. and before long we will all be doing this you know right I, and there's many of us that are just you know called and waking up to it a little bit beforehand just like you know 50 years ago people didn't think vegans could survive you right. know and now veganism is huge you know um Fasting is huge. This is like mega trends that are already happening. Also, this thing with respect to our relationship with the earth, like we've seen this, the effects of our sense of separation and the sense of this, you know, dominator uh, society that uh, seeks control, you know, right. and nature's systems are, I'm, you know, a student of the Tao, you know, it's so much larger than us. You know, when we when mm -hmm. we align and harmonize with that energy, we align with the whole energy of creation. And so moving back to natural with like 
not back, but forward, we can take our current systems and retool them to be synergistic, you know, with the natural ecology. And we, I believe we're actually the gardeners of the planet. There's uh, substantial evidence when I studied in permaculture school um, that the Amazon rainforest, for instance, was created by indigenous people. Was planted. Because they would, yeah. Right. They would uh, inoculate, it's all sand underneath, you know, and they would make these midden piles and inoculate it with terra preta is what they call it. Mm -hmm. And then they would plant out their favorite plants. Same has been found in Northern Europe. You know, this has been, this is part of our, you know, as well as the pyramid building, et cetera. Like right. we have actually, what's more natural to us is to cultivate life, you know, and to cultivate our own vitality, the vitality of our families, the soil, than it is to be in separation, competition, trying mm -hmm. to control, which is an anxiety, you know, mm -hmm. um, instead of rel relinquishing to the way of nature, you know, and, and, and the way of feeling and natural time, you know, instead of forcing things into being, you know, this is going to be a natural becoming. And, you know, the whole thoughts of ascension of the entire, you know, a collective consciousness of humanity and the whole planet uh, is we sort of, there's, I feel there is a bit of a bifurcation. They, they talked about this, I remember years ago, I think maybe even Trumbull it did, of 3D and 5D, you know, mm -hmm. people want to choose, you know, the technocratic control system um, you know, we are all endowed with, you know, uh, the divine right to choose, you know, and so that is going to be the decision, decision experience of some, and there's going to be others who experience this, this higher vibration, 5D experience of connection to the heart field to one another and everything through, you know, pranic powers, greater powers of mind, you know, greater uh, synergy with nature as we design natural system, permacultural system, cities could be, you know, with solar panels and apiaries on the top and living mm -hmm. wall with food forests and, you know, bioremediation um, of, you know, the non-point source pollutants. We could feed everybody, you know, we could have, we can use our creativity because we're creators, not consumers, mm -hmm. create whatever we want. Can we overcome global warming? in the way it's current path. What's your opinion? Absolutely, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I, I recommend everybody check out on Netflix, uh, Kiss the Ground. This is a great vindication for my work of the last 20 years and a lot of permaculturists have been saying this forever. Mm -hmm. When we stop doing till agriculture, and um, because the tillage of agriculture releases more carbon every year uh, than our activity with machines and everything else. It also more, carbon is also not the problem we're a carbon based planet with carbon based life we need to plant plants to sequester that carbon right. food forests you know rather than planting kale planting trees is going to sequester a lot more carbon right so in this movie they talk detail how we can have carbon drawdown not just carbon you know um control but actually uh bringing the system back to balance you know Mm -hmm. And all these pollutants that we've uh, created, nature has these interesting organisms that do what biologists call biological transmutation. Um, for instance, like the oyster mushrooms that can take petrochemicals, mm -hmm. eat them up, make them into their bodies and transmute them into edible mushrooms with no trace pollutants. Wow. Um, so... It's Rolling it's such an exciting idea that the, the technology is already there, but we're learning that the Earth's technology gives us a way out of this. And I, I, I see that Pe people like you are on the forefront, awakening us to this possibility because we so far we think that we, we don't look to nature for the solution. We try to look for somewhere else. Yeah, it's we look really for a, there. Technolog a technological solution to a biological problem. The technology know? is already right in front of us. It's the tree right? Yeah. It's a perfect exactly. technology, right? <laughs> That's our carbon sequestration that we've been looking for, you know, right? just trees, let's just plant more. I, I think it's a matter of international security. We could, you know, uh, if we don't, if we plan to fail, we, if we, uh, sorry, fail to plan, we can plan to fail. So right. not talking about predictions, I'm talking about a plan. Right. We can plan out a better future. 
you know. Um, and it just takes this collective will and collective, you know, desire. And I think it's, that's what pleases me with seeing people getting out into their gardens and stuff again. We have economic crisis potentially looming. And if you look at, you know, times in the past, like even the last world war, the victory gardens that sustain communities, you know, this can keep you resilient through this time physically, through the health practice of being out in the elements, creating in a garden, growing fresh food, you know, um, you can also, uh, you know, heal the planet simultaneously by doing this action of, you know, sequestration of carbon and bioremediation of soil. Mm -hmm. um, so it's taking on that uh, charge and responsibility. If, if we're the beings of highest consciousness here, and if we've created this, it is our responsibility, you know, to do something about it. So, so I, I, I've got to ask you, you have a great Qigong routine. Uh, I saw your video. I, I tried out similar to what I do, you know, and, and Qigong changed my life. It's something, first of all, do you, do you find it powerful to do your Qigong before you meditate? Like before you sun, sun gaze, um, it's sort of an amplifier. You, you come into it with all this energy it, it, or do you do it afterwards? What, t tell me, first of all, when you like to do your, your Qigong practice. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a very good question and it, you know, causes me to question a little bit because, you know, it does make sense. You know, the, the spinal column is like the, and the nerves are like the power lines for this electric right. energy, you know? And so when you unwind everything and open it up, mm -hmm. it's going to flow better on the body side. So what I do is a flip of that. I wake right. up and while I'm still fuzzy, you know, like I, I meditate and mm -hmm. I get behind the wheel. And this, another breatharian brother, uh, Dow Lore talks about this. Yeah. So, um, he talks about how we should rise like the sun slowly. The sun doesn't just zip up into the sky. Right. Right. Our energy is connected with the sun. So we should rise slowly. So I, I wake up and I meditate. And then in that first hour of the day, I do my sun gazing practice. And then I do my qigong out in the sun grounded. You know, mm -hmm. just as soon as I'm done sun gazing. Um, and then, you know, uh, that just sets the tone for the day. On, on the mm -hmm. one hand, it, starting by meditating, I, I dial into my own vibration, my own heart mind, what it's telling me, you know, still coming out of the dream world in that subconscious state. And then I get into the sunshine, you know, and the sun is, you know, informing me about the vibration of the day you know that mm -hmm. and like we were talking about earlier this whole thing of being like an instrument it's this symphony of being right so getting into the vibration the dominant vibration of the day because sometimes you don't want what the day has spelled out for you you know what I mean? <laughs> right and if you can just get on track with it it's it's easier you know mm -hmm. um it's one of these energetic you know things of keeping your energies um, to yourself as much as possible not to yourself, you want to give them, they have to flow through you, but it's this thing of um, guarding and maintaining, not guarding. <laughs> I like more like building, maintaining awareness of your energy. Right. So, um, and then the Qigong, just to open up the body and get ready for my day, because I'm a landscaper, gardener, you know, herb herbalist, skateboarder. I'm a quadruple Aries, so like I'm hyperactive. I, I get out there and get moving. Right. You know? <laughs> so I, I make an argument in my book um, that we kind of, if we have enough energy when we do these meditations, if we've had access and really ramped up our energy, um, we, we can have these quantum jumps, you know, even uh, so above, so below. When we look at a quantum particle, when it gets enough energy, it, it doesn't just slide over, it disappears and pops out somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so I experienced after doing those kind of meditations with those kind of energy practices, um, reality shifts where I was seeing stuff in my reality that, um, you know, I, I really questioned my own sanity. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've taught this with other people, other people have experienced, but somebody that like you, that's doing it on a daily basis. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you, do you, there's like a, you can, if you, if you use your energy, right, you can go through a literal shift in your reality where it feels like you're in another timeline or another reality altogether. It may not be, but it, 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 it has this effect when you're playing with these energies. 
Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, our mind is the quantum generator, right? Right. So the thoughts that you're emanating are creating, you know, the, the reality. And when you shift your vibration and shift your energy or your thought form, the reality shifts with you or because of you. you know? Right. Um, so um, it's this thing, you know, I, in pursuit, you know, of the breatharian path, um, not for bragging rights or for anything like that. It's more like um, I want to uh, free myself of the confines of the root chakra, you know, so that I can um, put myself wholly into the practice of opening my heart chakra. Mm -hmm. Because this is a thing is where a lot of us are stuck in our, our root chakra. It's a great place, you know, but between, you know, just sex, eating, you know, um, work and survival thoughts, you know, we're kind of in fight or flight, you know, um, you know and in this sense of, you know, that we're, we're not secure, you know, mm -hmm. um, and this has been very alleviating to me in this sense, in a, in a variety of ways, but, you know, it's what in Buddhism, they talk about the rainbow transformation body. Mm -hmm. we're all beings of light already but through the concentration of your mind and through the harmonization of the four elements in your body you can actually turn into rainbow light um, right all the colors of the rainbow we're, we we are just a prism that just um becomes all those colors you know or red orange blue green violet indigo all of those right so i i, I can see that mm -hmm. so uh, uh, teach me about breath you know, um, obviously I've had huge shifts and learned so much about breath. It seems like it's a never ending thing to learn so many different breath techniques um, mm -hmm. that, and so I just find myself constantly wanting to experiment and, and try different ones. And so, you know, alternate nostril breathing, just na na nose breathing, breathing through my diaphragm, fire breathing, super slow breathing, you name it. They're all, I'll, I'll breathe through my left nose for an hour and, ch and checking to breathe through the right, you know. Talk to me about your journey with breath and, and for somebody that wants to start experimenting, give, give me some, some new techniques and ideas about breath that help me to, to learn that a little bit better. Well, um, I have a very kind of basic uh, breath work style yeah. uh, that came from, I studied, I, I went ahead uh, and spent a little time at a monastery, uh, Rinzai G uh, Zen monastery, uh, here in the Jemez Mountains, some dear friends of ours. Um, and I really like the Renzai G style because the whole thing is just sit, you know, mm -hmm. just sit and breathe and be with your mind, you know. And they focus on, you know, straight posture, uh, nose breathing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but um, so that's really, a lot of people uh, are really into the breath work of the various kinds because you can get high. You yeah, know, exactly. Um, this is more about getting centered, you know, getting mm -hmm. balanced rather than getting high, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I send, I focus my awareness on my heart center and I just nose breathe because nose breath is definitely the, be the best breath mm -hmm. because it's, it's nitric oxide. It's just like if you put uh, nitric oxide in your gas tank in your car, it's like supercharged fuel. Right. And it spirals right up into your brain and like passes by the pineal gland, you know, and stimulates your pineal gland as well. Mm -hmm. So definitely fond of the nose breathing. Um, another thing I, I really like to work with is the microcosmic orbit where you mm -hmm. focus on the different energy centers of your body. This is from the Taoist tradition. So you meditate and at each spot you will spend, um, you know, I, I usually do it in counts of breaths and I like threes. So I'll, you start with like your Dantian mm -hmm. and do that for like nine breaths, you know, long, deep, you know, breaths with your concentration, you know, in that awareness point. And then uh, your genitals, mm -hmm. then your perineum, then your tailbone, then in the middle of your back and then between your shoulder blades, then the base of your skull, your mm -hmm. fontanelle, your third eye, your throat chakra, 
your heart and your solar plexus. And then you start to circulate the energy with your breath up mm -hmm. and down. And you'll find that this actually starts to really, uh, you start to feel digestion or just satiety or groundedness in your center, you know, mm -hmm. and it's partly connecting into your root. You know, a lot of people will meditate trying to get high and then there's just not this, like you were mentioning, it's important to keep your connection with the ground and the sky, you know, uh, to, right. be, to be in wholeness and balance. Um, the hardest thing for me is letting the breath breathe me. I'm all about breathing. I want to take over and be the boss and do the breathing. And so when, uh, you know, my mentor said, you need to let the breath breathe you. I struggle with that. I struggle because I want to be in control and to let the breath breathe me. It, it's hard. It's kind of that place where the subconscious starts. Yeah. That's where I like this style because you're just concentrating your awareness, you know, on a, a point in your body mm -hmm. and just breathing and kind of, uh, not concentrating on the breath style, mm -hmm. you know, um, you just, it's, it's more, you know, in the background. So your consciousness can be more on these center points, you know, and, and then that nourishes these different center points uh, of your body. There's actually, right. you know, uh, nerve plexuses and ganglion and, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of stuff connected to these different points in your body. Um, so, so just a question, something somewhat unrelated, just because you're somebody that works with energy centers and has an intuitive feel for the energy in your body. Um, something that is discussed in reality transurfing, also Carlos Castaneda with the uh, the uh, the assemblage point. Do you do you ever feel a mass of energy behind your back? Do you feel, uh, in particular, a concentration of energy? Anywhere behind your back, do you, do you, is that something that you notice in conjunction with anything? I'd love to get your, your vibe on that. This is your angel wings. Everybody has them. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's part of coming in. These, there's these two, you know, between your center and your, your uh, between your shoulder blades and your mm -hmm. back. Right. And the one at the base of your skull. There's a lot of energy there. Right. Know? And it is this thing of the toroidal field. You know, and so you have this, this, it's like a 360 donut around, you know, and so it's feeding in in all places through here and then out your anus. Right. You know, um, it's tube, almost like that is that energy is more of a wave form. It's like a different kind of energy that we can't see it. So it hasn't collapsed into particle yet. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like part, of, I, I view it as part of your intuition. You know how your mom right. always had eyes in the back of her head, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing where you can sense things behind you, you know? Right. Yeah. So, if you sit and just sense, just try to focus the, the, the you know, right behind you, there's something else that sort of happens. Yeah. Right. So that's fun to play with too. And as you're meditating, you sort of get, you know, with, I find with this heart center meditation, you start to get a feel of your, your whole auric field, you know, and really uh, this sense of, to me, beyond opening pranic powers or superhuman things, it's a the the major superhuman power to open up is our compassion. It really you know? is. We open up the oneness, and in, in in that process, and that is the ultimate power, right? Absolutely, and love. And love, love. is that drives everything. It is. So and so. It's so exciting to, to meet somebody that has gone through this spiritual transformation that has found the connection to the earth and the sun. And, uh, you know, just you are the, the signal that, that we need on this planet. And I'm seeing it more and more. So keep what you're doing, what you're doing, you're changing the world. What we need to do is we need to find that fundamental connection back to the earth, back to the sun. So I, I'm telling everybody that's watching this, check out uh, ziapermaculture.com. You offer some interesting courses on permaculture and uh, you've been learning about gardening the mind and planting seeds. Now it's start to learn about gardening the earth. They're the same thing. And in the process you learn, I, I, I think there's a, a metaphor in it. Like when you learn, when you plant the seeds in your garden and watch them sprout, you start to understand how your thoughts 
are like seeds in the world as well. And so it's it's a huge thing. And I'm recommending everybody just go out, start talking to your plants, staring at them, get, connect to them. Uh, I think that, that this is where the world changes and this is where the new earth is formed. Um, and I think that's the beginning part. I think this is it. I agree. I love that. Thank you. Yes. So, so thank you for coming on the Reality Revolution. Thank you so much for all that you do and keep up the good work and look forward to talking to you again. And, I'll, and I, I'm on Facebook. I'll keep on doing any energy exercises or any meditations you have on there. So <laughs> thank you so much. My great pleasure, Brian. So good to meet you and connect. Good to meet you, man. Wholeness and balance, brother. We return you now to your local announcement.